Hello and welcome to the final lecture podcast for the Sheridan College General Education course, Canada in the Making, Understanding Canadian History. In this last lecture podcast, we're really going to be looking at contemporary Canada since the year 1980. We're going to see the signing of the Constitution, where Canada took the final step to become fully and completely independent from the United Kingdom. We'll also see Canada's unity challenge like never before, with two referendums um, seeking to separate the province of Quebec from the rest of Canada. All of that today on the final lecture podcast for Canadian History. The learning outcomes for this last lecture podcast are Number one, describe the unity crisis between English Canada and Quebec of the 1980s and 1990s. Number two, understand the major political themes of the 1980s and 1990s, including Western alienation, the rise of the Bloc Québécois, and the Reform Party. And number three, discuss contemporary political and economic conditions in Canada over the past two decades. So in my last lecture podcast, we left off with Pierre Elliott Trudeau as the Prime Minister of Canada and the Liberals were the party in power at the time. So I want to give you now a quick whirlwind tour of politics in Canada during the 1970s. So Trudeau had uh, become the leader of the Liberal Party after Lester B. Pearson had retired in 1968 and shortly thereafter, under Trudeau's leadership, the Liberals won a majority government in 1968. And this was largely because of Trudeau's personal popularity. He was young at the time, and commentators likened his popularity with young people almost to being like a rock star. It was sometimes referred to as Trudeau mania, because there would be gaggles of young people surrounding him asking for autographs, that sort of thing. However, during Trudeau's tenure as prime minister, he had faced some serious tests of his leadership. Um, most uh, seriously, the 1970 FLQ or October crisis, in which Trudeau made the unprecedented step of invoking the War Measures Act for only the third time in Canadian history. So for those reasons and others, the popularity of the Liberals had certainly begun to slip by the time we reached the 1972 election. It didn't help as well that the economy was slumping and the Liberals themselves didn't really have much of a platform to run on. They ran a series of television ads uh, with the slogan, the land is strong against a backdrop of Canadian scenery and images and nobody was really sure what it all meant at all. It was routinely mocked by other uh, leaders, particularly the leader of the Progressive Conservative Party and the main rival to, uh, to um, uh, Trudeau, and that was Robert Stanfield. The campaign was hard fought and very, very close. In the end, the Liberals managed to eke out a bare minority. Uh, here you see Stanfield uh, very disappointed on election night watching the returns come in. Um, and... In fact, it was so close that on the night of the election, they didn't even know who had won the most number of seats. But in the end, the Liberals did maintain a minority government. By the time the 1974 election rolled around, this time Robert Stanfield and the Progressive Conservatives really felt that this would be their time. The uh, popularity of Trudeau hadn't improved very much. However, Trudeau and the Liberals decided to make the campaign more about uh, personal popularity and age. They tried to present Stanfield as old and uh, out of touch, and uh, the Liberals actually showcased Trudeau frequently with his young family. Here you see Trudeau and his wife and their young son, Justin Trudeau, who now, of course, is the Prime Minister today of Canada. Uh, Stanfield, on the other end, also had some major missteps during the campaign. Uh, this was a really unfortunate photo shoot that he did in North Bay, where he was photographed by the press uh, playing football, but he fumbled the football, as you can see. And it was that picture, the third picture from the left that ran in newspapers the next day with uh, the headline, uh, Stanfield fumbles the ball. So for all those reasons, um, the election didn't obviously go very well for the Conservatives and the Liberals were able to eke out a majority again in 1974. So in the interim, then uh, Stanfield, the uh, leader of the Progressive Conservatives, resigned and the Progressive Conservatives on the eve of the next election in 1979 had a young, new, fresh-faced leader, Joe Clark. 
So Joe Clark um, uh, ran a pretty good campaign. Um, he did a good debate. Here is a picture of the televised debate with Ed Broadbent, the leader of the NDP, Pierre Trudeau, and Joe Clark uh, on May 13th, 1979. And the election, like last time, uh, ended up being very close. Um, in the end, Joe Clark managed to eke out a minority government this time and became the youngest prime minister in Canadian history at 39 years of age. However, his government uh, only managed to last nine months. Minority governments often don't last very long. And we were thrown into an election again in 1980. And this time, the Liberals again under Trudeau would win a majority one more time. But this would be Trudeau's last election as the leader of the Liberal Party. As I'll explain in a, a couple slides, uh, he would ultimately be replaced before the next election by a new leader of the Liberal Party, John Turner. The Quebec sovereignty movement had been brewing in the province for at least a couple of decades since the late 1940s with the rise of the Quiet Revolution, uh, which is something we talked about in the last podcast, which not only changed in many respects the culture of the province, but also sought uh, to see Quebec become more independent in many respects. However, the sovereignty movement got a huge boost when on November 15th, 1976, the Sovereignist Party, the Parti Québécois, won the provincial election and René Lévesque became the new premier of the province. Now, the Parti Québécois had promised that they would hold a referendum on Quebec uh, separating from Canada and becoming its own country within the first term in office if they were elected. And they kept that promise. The first referendum uh, for Quebec sovereignty took place in 1980. It was a bitter campaign for both sides, both sides accusing each other of uh, duplicitous tactics in the campaign. And for many young people, it became a litmus test of who was a Quebecer and who was not. On the Stay in Canada side, Pierre Trudeau, as the Prime Minister, fought against separation. And being a Quebecer himself, his voice carried quite a bit of weight. Here you see him at one of the pro-Canada rallies. The actual referendum itself had an unprecedented 85% participation uh, in the province. And in the end, the no side, the stay in Canada side, won 60% of the vote. Half of all Francophone voters supported staying in the province. However, the Parti Québécois, although disappointed in the results, uh, continued to believe that sovereignty was the only viable option. Le René Lévesque, on the eve of his defeat, said, If I have understood you correctly, you are telling us until next time. And there would indeed be a next time. But in the meantime, Trudeau would try to uh, reform the country and improve unity by seeking to create for the first time a new constitution for the country. So with the failure of the sovereignist movement to succeed in the Quebec referendum, uh, Trudeau and the Liberal government believed very strongly that the best way to make sure that Quebec felt like they were part of Canada was to have a new, truly Canadian constitution and to become, for the first time, truly in every respect, an independent country. Because up until this point in time, Canada did not have a constitution of its own. Really, the structure of the Canadian government uh, was created through several different acts of the British Parliament, the most important of which being the British North American Act. And only the British Parliament in London, England, had the power to actually change any of this. Now, if you recall from an earlier lecture podcast, in 1931, the British Parliament had passed the Statute of Westminster, and this had given the power uh, to self-governing parts of the empire to essentially create their own constitutions and to create their own in fully independence um, if they wanted to. So Trudeau and the Liberal government believed that the best answer to the Quebec sovereignty movement would to be to create a truly new Canadian constitution and to uh, finally cut the last ties um, that they had with the British Parliament in London. So this was going to be a complicated measure because Trudeau and the government would need to get all 10 provinces in Canada to agree to what would be in the new constitution and a new proposed Charter of Rights and Freedoms. In the end, 
all the provinces except Quebec agreed to the new constitution and signed it. Quebec did not because they felt that they would be overwhelmed by the English majority of the rest of Canada and they felt that they needed uh, separate powers that would uh, recognize the unique nature of the province of Quebec, that it was a language minority with French and that they needed special powers to be able to preserve that. It was impossible to get all of the other provinces to give up or cede any powers to make uh, to make Quebec have any sort of special status. So in the end, a compromise, all of the provinces except Quebec signed and agreed to the new constitution. And with that, in 1982, the Canada Act, as it was called, and the accompanying Charter of Rights and Freedoms ended the British Parliament's power to amend the British North America Act. And from this point onward, and here you see Queen Elizabeth signing the Canada Act in 1982 with Pierre Trudeau. From this point onward, uh, Canada now was a completely independent country in every respect. However, the fact that Quebec had not signed the Constitution would remain a splinter in the national unity of the country and would be something that would be returned to again soon. Once we get into the early 1980s, uh, Trudeau's personal popularity with the Canadian people uh, was at a very low point, and it became clear to him that he would likely not win another election if he stayed on as the leader of the Liberal Party and Prime Minister. According to a story that he told himself, he went out for a walk in the snow in early of 1984 in Ottawa, and during that walk, he decided that it was time for him to retire. Uh, and so when he did, there was a uh, new election within the Liberal Party to choose a new leader. And the new leader would be John Turner, who became leader of the Liberal Party. And this was on the eve of the next federal election. So briefly then, John Turner did become prime minister uh, because you don't need to have a separate election. You wait until the next election is going to happen and, and that's when there'll be an election. The prime minister is simply the leader of the party with the most number of seats. Uh, so John Turner became the uh, next Prime Minister of Canada, but a new election was going to happen soon. And on the Conservative uh, Party side, the Progressive Conservative side, they also had a young, new, bright leader that would be challenging John Turner in the next election. And the leader of the Progressive Conservative Party was Brian Mulroney. Brian Mulroney would be uh, one of the more, most successful Canadian politicians during the 1980s. Here you see a picture of him at the top there with his wife at a campaign event. So in 1984, we had John Turner, who had recently become leader of the Liberal Party and Prime Minister, and we were entering into a new federal election. Now, on the eve of the election, John Turner had actually made a number of patronage appointments to the Senate of Liberal friends and insiders. Um, as a favor, essentially, to the outgoing Prime Minister, Pierre Trudeau. Well, this would end up playing uh, a huge role in the election itself, and, and Brian Mulroney was able to make a lot of political hay of it. Uh, so what you see there in the uh, bottom left corner is an image from the televised uh, leaders debate uh, in the 1984 election, and it is perhaps the most famous political debate ever to air on Canadian television because it truly did change the whole uh, course of the election itself. Itself. So you see on the left there, John Turner pointing at Brian Mulroney. Uh, in the middle there is Ed Broadbent. He was the leader of the New Democratic Party. And on the right is Brian Mulroney, the leader of the Progressive Conservative Party. So during the debate on television, Brian Mulroney had questioned John Turner about those patronage appointments that he had made. And John Turner essentially said, uh, I had no choice. I had to make them. And then Brian Mulroney shook his finger at him and said, you had a choice, sir. You had a choice. It was some pretty uh, amazing television uh, to watch. In any respect, uh, it did uh, change the course of the election. And in 1984, the Liberals were defeated by the Progressive Conservatives, led by Brian Mulroney, uh, who uh, were then swept into a majority government. Now, one of the other things that Brian Mulroney had promised during the campaign was to enter into free uh, trade negotiations with the United States. So here you see Brian Mulroney uh, posing with the American president, Ronald Reagan, in the 1980s. So in this respect, um, 
the fact that the Conservative Party under Brian Mulroney was advocating for free trade really is the opposite of the historical positions on free trade that the Liberals and the Conservatives had held. If you recall from um, several lecture podcasts ago, in the late 19th century, uh, when Canada was just formed, one of the major differences between the Liberal Party and the Conservative Party was their stance on trade. And it had been the Liberal Party back then that had believed that free trade, that is trade without tariffs or barriers or taxes uh, was the best way for the Canadian economy to do well, um, that we would integrate goods and services between the United States and Canada and it would overall be a positive thing. On the other side of that debate back then, it had been the Conservative Party with John A. Macdonald arguing vehemently that uh, free trade would be bad for the country, that Canada needed to protect our smaller industry from the larger economy of the United States, and that we needed to um, impose tariffs on incoming foreign goods in order to preserve um, um, Canadian made goods and um, services. So really they are then in the 1980s taking the completely different historical positions because it would be the Liberal Party that would argue vehemently against free trade, that free trade would destroy Canada, that we'd be overwhelmed by the American economy, that our culture would even be destroyed as well. Here you see Brian Mulroney walking past protesters. The whole um, debate about free trade was um, you know, quite uh, divisive to a degree within Canada. Um, the negotiations with the United States continued right up until the next election, which was in 1988, and really it was another election based on free trade. That was the major question, because if Brian Mulroney and his Conservatives were re-elected, that would be what would happen. And so here you see him once again debating John Turner at the televised debate. Um, Mulroney did win the election, and as a result, uh, he uh, finished those trade negotiations with the United States and the Canada-United States Free Trade Agreement uh, was finally signed in 1988. Eventually, the uh, free trade agreement would be expanded to include Mexico and was replaced with the North American Free Trade Agreement uh, uh, in 1994. And uh, we have had free trade, essentially, uh, between all three countries ever since, although it was more recently amended um, uh, under uh, the presidency of Donald Trump. So the fact that Quebec had never signed the Constitution continued to be an issue which was haunting politics during the 1980s. Um, so the Parti Québécois uh, and, and their leader, uh, René Lévesque, had obviously they had failed to, to sign the Constitution, but that didn't mean that Quebec wasn't still bound by it. The other nine provinces had signed it and the Constitution was in, is, was in effect in the mid-80s. However, this led to a feeling of estrangement of Quebec compared to the rest of Canada. Brian Mulroney really wanted to see Quebec brought into the Constitution. And so in order to do this, he um, called for a series of meetings with all uh, of the provincial leaders with uh, the federal government to come up with some sort of agreement that would allow for uh, Quebec to uh, become a more full partner within Canada. This became known as the Meech Lake Accord, uh, which was um, agreed in 1987. It was called um, Meech Lake because that was where the uh, leaders of the provinces and Maroonie and his government were meeting. Um, Meech Lake was a, um, uh, a resort area in the Gatineau Hills near Ottawa. So what they came up with in the Meech Lake Accord was uh, a, a, basically a, a range of issues. One of them was the idea that they would the Meech Lake Accord in the Constitution would formally recognize that Quebec and uh, the Francophone uh, people uh, had a distinct society within Canada so that they would be recognized as being distinct from the rest of Canada. It also allowed for all the provinces to have much more wide ranging autonomy over their own affairs. It essentially would grant to uh, provinces the power uh, to control immigration to a certain degree into their provinces. It would allow them to opt out of uh, federally run social programs. It would also allow provinces um, that they would be the ones to nominate people uh, into the Senate and the Supreme Court. Now, at least initially, uh, the um, 
Mitch Lake Accord was, you know, received fairly warmly in the media. But as people began to learn more about it, widespread criticism and opposition began to present itself across the country, uh, particularly to the distinct society clause. The idea that Quebec would be special and different from the rest of the provinces didn't sit well with much of English Canada. Uh, Pierre Trudeau, in fact, came out of retirement and argued uh, uh, vehemently against the accord, saying that Brian Mulroney had essentially sold out Canada as a country to local parochial interests of the provinces. There also was opposition from Indigenous leaders. So Elijah Harper, who was a, um, a politician and a member of the legislature in Manitoba, argued that the Meech Lake uh, Accord had made no reference to Indigenous people who were basically had been left out of the original constitution and now were being left out of that, that there was no recognition that they also had a distinct society. And so he was one of the more vocal advocates against the Meech Lake Accord as well. With all of this opposition and the fact that it would have required Required all 10 provinces to have it ratified in their legislatures. Um, basically, support for it fell apart. Um, and this would have profound impact on Canada. One of the uh, impacts was that people in Quebec, politicians in Quebec, felt once again that they had been betrayed by the rest of Canada, that the rest of Canada hadn't recognized their, you know, distinct society. Um, in fact, one of uh, Brian Mulroney's cabinet ministers, uh, Lucien Boussard, actually resigned from Mulroney's government and formed a new political party on the federal scene known as the Bloc Québécois. And their sole purpose would be to try to achieve sovereignty for Quebec. So really, the Meech Lake Accord, rather than uh, solving the issues of sovereignty and the issues of unity within the country, actually set the stage for yet another major debate about Quebec sovereignty and the second referendum. So the Quebec sovereignty movement wasn't the only crisis of unity that was facing the country during the 1980s. A growing problem was something that is sometimes referred to as Western alienation. This is a sense of discontent that many people in the Western provinces of Canada, particularly Alberta, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, sometimes including British Columbia, felt. The idea was is that politicians tended to pander to Eastern provinces, particularly the populous ones of Ontario and Quebec, and they tended to ignore the interests of people who lived in the West. It really started to come to the forefront in the mid-1970s during the energy crisis. This was where oil shortages were felt around the world and the price of oil went through the roof. Uh, in order to counter that, the uh, Liberal government under Pierre Elliott Trudeau instituted uh, the National Energy Program, the NEP, and this forced Western oil producers to sell their oil below market rates to Eastern Canada. This was absolutely hated in the West. It was seen as a massive overreach in government intrusion uh, into Western interests, and it suited uh, the Eastern provinces just fine, but not the West. A popular uh, slogan that you would see on bumper stickers beginning in the 1970s was, let the Eastern bastards freeze in the dark. Uh, so Western alienation was a problem before Mulroney, but it got worse under Mulroney's government. Mulroney's attempts to bring Quebec into um, the uh, Confederation more fully uh, by including it in the Constitution with his um, Meech Lake Accord really was seen in the West as a pandering to Quebec interests, that Quebec is getting all these things like a distinct society clause and nobody uh, in government at least really cares about the West. And so this is when we really start to see a call for a new Western focused conservative party that would represent interests in the West. And the Reform Party would be the ultimate end of these calls. It was formed in 1987 with the slogan, The West Wants In. Here you see Preston, uh, Preston Manning, uh, the first leader of the Reform Party. And in the uh, later 1980s, the right-wing agenda of the Reform Party and its uh, calls for more autonomy for Western provinces and um, that the Western provinces want a greater say in Confederation, it really did gain quite a bit of popularity. In the 1988 election, uh, the Reform Party did reasonably well, considering they were a new party. Even though they didn't get any of their MPs elected, it definitely singled uh, uh, to Mulroney that he was going to have to deal with Western alienation within his own conservative 
party or else he might risk having uh, electoral defeat soon. However, Brian Mulroney was determined to plow ahead with his goal of somehow uh, bringing Quebec into the Constitution. Despite the failure of the Meech Lake Accord, uh, Mulroney wasn't deterred, and they made a second attempt uh, with the Charlottetown Accord in 1992. Uh, and in this attempt, Quebec was again given uh, various concessions, including um, a distinct society clause. Other provinces were given concessions too. It really, the Charlottetown Accord amounted to a major decentralization of power. So taking power away from the federal government and given to provinces. Uh, indigenous um, uh, people were also um, given some nods as well. There was a recognition that there would be some form of Aboriginal self-government that would be defined later. Uh, and during this time period, suddenly constitutional law became something of public debate. Everyone was arguing about the merits of, of whether this was the best uh, way forward for Canada as a country. Politically, Mulroney couldn't push it through without at least getting some form of buy-in from the larger public, and so he agreed to hold a referendum. Unfortunately for Mulroney, uh, all, everybody said no. It was 54% said no, and so as a result, the Charlottetown Accord failed, and this was the last serious attempt to try to bring Quebec into the Constitution, and Quebec still uh, is not part of the Constitution to this day. So on the eve of the 1993 uh, federal election in Canada, the Progressive Conservatives, although they were the ruling party and they were still in a majority position, uh, weren't doing very well. Uh, they had uh, had the failed Charlottetown Accord, the failed Meech Lake Accord, and that had um, meant that they'd taken a real hit in their support in Quebec. In fact, as, as I mentioned earlier, uh, one of um, uh, Brian Mulroney's own cabinet ministers had broken away, Lucien Bouchard, to form a new Quebec party, a sovereigntist party named the Bloc Québécois. And Brian Mulroney's conserv progressive conservative government was also facing um, dissension in the western part of Canada. We have the rise of the Reform Party there, a conservative alternative party. And so not surprisingly, in 1993, Brian Mulroney decided to retire from politics before the election. And this, of course, opened up a vacancy. And a new leader of the Progressive Conservative Party was chosen, and that was Kim Campbell. And then by virtue of the fact that before the election, the Conservatives still had the majority in the House of Commons, that meant that Kim Campbell automatically, on the retirement of Brian Mulroney, became the new Prime Minister of Canada. She was and remains the only female Prime Minister that Canada has ever had. Unfortunately for Kim Campbell, she wouldn't remain Prime Minister very long because uh, the 1993 election, which she faced shortly after becoming Prime Minister, would not fare well for the Progressive Conservatives. Here you see uh, at the bottom uh, left there the an image of the televised uh, debate of the leaders. Uh, going from left to right, we have Jean Chrétien, who was the new leader of the Liberal Party. He had been a minister under Trudeau's government. Uh, then we have Kim Campbell, the Prime Minister and leader of the Progressive Conservative Party. Uh, next, coming from the left, is Preston Manning, who was the leader of the Reform Party. The Reform Party had grown so popular at this point that the uh, organizers of the televised debate had invited him to participate in the uh, in the election debate. Alongside him is Lucien Boussard, who is the leader of the newly formed Bloc Québécois, a sovereigntist federal party. Uh, from Quebec and Lucien Bouchard, as I said, had been one of Brian Mulroney's cabinet ministers before he had resigned on the failure of the Meech Lake Accord. And then beside uh, Lucien Bouchard was the new leader of the New Democratic Party, Audrey McLaughlin. So this is how the House of Commons looked in 1993 prior to the dissolution and the new election. So there were 295 seats at that point in time in the House of Commons. Brian Mulroney had been the Prime Minister. He was the leader of the Progressive Conservatives. But when he resigned, the Conservatives uh, chose a new leader from amongst their ranks, and that was Kim Campbell. And thus she became the Prime Minister for a short period of time. And here we have on the Liberal side, the leader was Jean Chrétien. Uh, Jean Chrétien, uh, during the election, had um, uh, proven to be a very um, adept politician, and uh, the attack ads that the Conservatives had run against him hadn't uh, really landed very well. And one of them in particular was very controversial because it had featured a picture of his face 
where it was very unflattering and it said uh, was this the man is this the man you could see as prime minister anyway people felt sorry for Jean Chrétien and that ad sort of blew up in the progressive conservatives faces and then we had the Bloc Québécois, which was being led by uh, former uh, progressive conservative cabinet minister Lucien Bouchard and Audrey McLaughlin um, running the New Democratic Party with 44 seats. So this was the way it was going into the election. The cons progressive conservatives have a firm majority of 156 seats. Well, when I said it went bad for the conservatives, you can't even imagine. I remember this election very well. It was, in fact, the very first election that I voted in as a young man. So here you see what the House of Commons looked like after the 1993 election. So the progressive conservatives were reduced to just two seats. And in fact, Kim Campbell herself lost her seat. We went from 156 seats, the majority government with the progressive conservatives down to just to seats to suggest that the progressive conservatives have been you know destroyed is an understatement it was a landslide for the liberal party with jean chretien becoming the new prime minister of canada with the liberals with 177 seats the election hadn't gone very well for the new democratic party as well they had been reduced to just nine seats but the bloc quebecois had won 54 seats that meant that they were the next largest party they actually became the official opposition they were joking in the press because the official opposition is normally referred to as her majesty's loyal opposition but of course the bloc quebecois wanted to see uh, the breakup of canada and the press would, uh, would poke fun at the fact that they were the her majesty's loyal opposition and the reform party did incredibly well too they had gone from uh just a couple of seats to suddenly 52 seats their leader preston manning becoming a new force in parliament so this is what the house of commons looked after the 1993 election which effectively saw the progressive conservative party destroyed so thus in 1993 the liberal party had been returned to power now with uh, jean chrétien as the newly elected prime minister so what was uh he like as a prime minister and what was the liberal party like well the liberal party in the 1990s really took um, a different turn than uh the party had been under uh trudeau and under turner uh, under Chrétien, uh, the Liberals really adopted what might be considered more of a, um, a 19th century idea of the world liberal. So going back to uh, the Liberals of the late 19th century who believed very strongly in um, uh, free trade and um and 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 looking after business interests the liberal party of the 1990 really emerges as the opposite of the post-war liberal consensus so under jean chrétien's government the liberal party um uh pursued sort of a freer economic um stance they had loose tr trade restrictions tried to loosen regulations they also made major cuts to the welfare state in the 1990s to try to balance the books um in many ways, though, although this was the way that John Cretchen and the and the leadership of the Liberal Party ran it during the 1990s, as a whole, the Liberal Party never fully adopted this philosophy. And eventually, under John Cretchen's successor, Paul Martin, the Liberal Party shifted back more to the left of the political spectrum. So here you see then an overview of the elections from 1994 to 2000. So uh, Brian Mulroney had won back-to-back -back majority governments in, in the 1980s and, and Kim Campbell had briefly become prime minister at the very end of their second mandate. And then we have back-to-back -back liberal governments throughout the 1990s. Uh, Jean Chrétien and the Liberals really handily was able to win election after election in the 1990s, and this is partially because of divided opposition. We have the Bloc Québécois, who they don't even have enough um, MPs in Quebec to actually form a majority government, so they took away votes from all the other political parties. We also had the rise of the Reform Party, who, which was never able to completely make inroads in eastern Canada, and so the um, uh, the Liberals were able to um, uh, capitalize on the divisions of the opposition parties, and that gave them a very safe majority uh, in 1993, 1997, and 2000. The success of the Bloc Québécois as a federal party, a party that was dedicated to 
um, basically achieving Quebec's aims at the federal level, that is at the level of the government of Canada, uh, did signal that the sovereignty movement was alive and well in the province again. So here you see an image of the leader of the Bloc Québécois, Lucien Bouchard, and the Prime Minister at the time, Jean Chrétien. Uh, they obviously look kind of grumpy and they were often um, political enemies uh, with one another. Certainly, um, uh, Jean Chrétien, despite being from Quebec, he was a fierce, fierce Federalist, meaning he really believed that Quebec should be part of Canada and Lucien Bouchard. Um, originally maybe had thought that, but he uh, had become uh, disillusioned with Canada following the failure of the Meech Lake Accord and the Charlottetown Accord, and he had uh, quit Brian Mulroney's government and founded the Bloc Québécois. The mood in the province of Quebec did uh, begin to swing more and more towards sovereignty by we time we get to the mid-1990s. The Parti Québécois was again returned to power in the province in 1994. The Parti Québécois was the party of um, uh, René Lévesque, who had um, brought forth the first referendum, which had ended in failure. And of course, René Lévesque had famously said, uh, until next time, meaning that we would be at this once more. The Parti Québécois had a new leader in 1994. His name was Jacques Perizeau. Here you see him uh, speaking to a crowd. He was a good public speaker and popular in the province, and he promised that when they would be returned to power that there would be a second referendum, and that's exactly what we got in 1995. The second referendum was going to be an incredibly divisive issue across the country and would really uh, hold the future of the country of Canada and, of course, the province of Quebec in the balance. The question that the Parti Québécois settled on, um, pu actually putting on the ballots that people would be voting on, was a rather confusing question. Let me read it to you. Do you agree that Quebec should become sovereign after having made a formal offer to Canada for a new economic and political partnership within the scope of the bill respecting the future of Quebec and the agreement signed on June 12, 1995? So, it's not clear. <laughs> really, the question is asking, do you want Quebec to be an independent country? But they didn't want to ask it so flat out like that. Instead, they wrapped it in language that suggests a partnership. Political partnership is the word that they would use because there was genuine fear within Quebec that they were too small to be able to make it on their own as a country. So the Parti Québécois tried to ease those concerns by suggesting that they would have some sort of pol uh, political and economic partnership with Canada. They'd share a currency, that sort of thing. Um, the bill that they are referencing was something that was um, uh, passed um, the initial stages by the Parti Québécois. It was basically a, a bill that would have declared Quebec as a sovereign country. Now, on the other side, people who were in support of Quebec remaining in Canada, Federalists, they very um, strongly disagreed with the wording of this question because it wasn't clear. For one thing, it suggested that there would be some sort of like free trade or economic partnership with the rest of Canada, and the rest of Canada was in no mood if Quebec had voted for uh, sovereignty to have have any negotiations with Quebec. Um, so it's very likely that in fact the opposite would have happened, that the rest of the country would have stonewalled Quebec in any sort of um, uh, agreement process following a positive referendum um, result. So it was uh, very controversial, the actual question. It wasn't clear and it promised things that as far as the rest of Canada were concerned, the Parti Québécois could not promise. The campaign would really pit Jean Chrétien against the leader of the Parti Québécois, Jacques Parizeau, in a battle of winning the hearts and minds of Quebecers. Because this vote, the referendum vote, was something that only Quebecers could vote on. The rest of the country had no um, say in the matter whatsoever at all. Another group of people that had been completely ignored in this question were the Indigenous people of uh, who lived in the province of Quebec. The Cree and the Inuit in particular, 
They felt that their concerns were being completely overlooked by the Parti Québécois. They decided to have their own symbolic referendum about whether they wanted to stay in Canada. Now, if they had chosen to stay in Canada, huge swaths of the land of the province were technically Indigenous land, Indigenous reserve land. And in that symbolic referendum, the Indigenous people said no. Here you see one of the most outspoken voices in the uh, uh, anti-Quebec leaving the province, Chief Matthew Kuncum, uh, who organized a native resistance to the idea of of separating from Canada. Many of the Indigenous people within the province of Quebec really felt that they would get a worse deal under um, a sovereign Quebec than they would under the country of Canada. The sovereigntists, of course, argued that the Indigenous people had no right to have their own referendum, that this wasn't a question for them, which of course is outrageous. Uh, towards the end of the uh, campaign, on the eve of the vote, uh, Jean Chrétien and the Federalists called for a unity rally in Montreal. They wanted Canadians from across the country to come to Montreal to show their support to Quebecers for a united Canada, to show their love for Quebec and Quebec culture, to show Quebecers that um, that they you know should remain within the country. And in fact, um, uh, there were um, all kinds of deals put in place by like Via Rail, the um, the railway in Canada that they offered discounts fares on Air Canada um, in order to get as many people to travel to Montreal on this weekend for this huge unity rally and it was absolutely massive look at this crush of people uh, anywhere from between 60 and 150,000 people from across the country came to Montreal for the unity rally on October 27th 1995 uh, there's some debate about exactly how many people were there. Somewhere in that crowd is a young 21-year-old version of me. I was one of the people that traveled from, uh, I was living at the time in Toronto, going to university, and I traveled to Montreal uh, in support of uh, Quebec remaining in the country. It was an experience that I will never forget. Um, there was so much uh, passion and joy within the crowd. And there were some pretty uh, crazy parties that evening in Montreal, let me tell you. In any respect, um, there were plenty of speeches that day um, and it played on the news. And so I'm going to now play you a news a clip covering the rally and some of the um, things going on on the eve of the referendum in Montreal in 1995. Good evening from our referendum studios here in Montreal. Well, this is it. The campaign has come down to this last weekend. What began as a romp for the no side has turned around. The latest polls have the yes side slightly in front. Both sides held rallies today, the biggest here in the heart of Montreal. Tens of thousands of people from all across Canada united in one message, an emotional appeal to Quebecers to stay. Our coverage tonight begins with those people and the CBC's Paul Adams. They converged on downtown Montreal in trains, on foot, by car, in a cavalcade of buses. We love you, it says in fractured French. For many of the thousands who came here from outside Quebec, it was an emotional journey. I'm a Francophone, I speak French, I live in Ontario, and Quebec is a part of Canada, and uh, we can't have a Canada without Quebec. It's like a taking apart a piece of your heart. It's a piece of my country. I don't want to see it hurt. It was a strange mix of pep rally and family reunion. Yeah, there was a lot of change. emotion this morning on the bus. Like So much emotion. Everyone was just breaking up into tears all over the place. They came from Atlantic Canada, from Ontario, and from the West. Thousands of people from outside Quebec. United we stand! It's only a few weeks since all these non-Quebecers were congratulated by the Prime Minister, no less, for staying out of the referendum campaign, for not making waves. Today they were invited in by the Federalist politicians to help salvage their faltering campaign. That we could just show that we love them and we want them to stay with us. And we'll do our best to push our politicians to change things. We all want change. In fact, the politicians serve mainly as a backdrop here. 
It's the crowd that made this an event. These are the images organizers hope will become a turning point in the campaign. From Saskatchewan in Manitoba. Because I hope they stay, and after they see all the support, I hope they do. But it is their choice. Thousands of Quebec Federalists, mostly Anglophones, swelled the crowd. They felt a bit besieged lately. Okay, so it was bad before, but it doesn't mean that it has to be bad forever. And if people want to try, you give it your best shot. To some Quebec Federalists, it almost seemed as if the cavalry was riding into the rescue. I'm from Montreal, and I'm overwhelmed that everybody came from all parts of Canada. We thought we were abandoned. We thought absolutely no one cared about us. And I owe everybody a great vote of thanks. It's beautiful. People in Quebec don't realize how much they're loved by other people in other provinces. They haven't traveled all, all that much. I don't know what they, we don't con, we don't have enough contact because we don't realize how much they love us. And we love them too. We love Canada. Sovereignists were asked by their own organizers to stay away from today's rally. But there were a few signs of their presence, including a message from Sovereignists overhead. Welcome to our new partners, it said. Paul Adams, CBC News, Montreal. When his turn came to address the crowd, Jean Chrétien decided to get personal. This was his fourth campaign appearance in Quebec in as many days, and by far his most emotional. Quebec is our home, he said, but Canada is our country. And to save the country, Chrétien said it must be changed to accommodate Quebecers and all Canadians. We will do what is needed. We will make the changes that are needed. We will do what is needed so that at the beginning of the next century, Canada will move in the 21st century, united from sea to sea. After spending his campaign on the economics of independence, Daniel Johnson switched from the heads to the hearts of Quebecers, saying they can't be stopped from loving Canada. Take a look at this crowd, he told the sovereignist leaders, and see what friendship and solidarity looks like. It's a message that plays well in this crowd, but that's not where it counts. Because ultimately, this referendum won't be decided by the people who are here, but by the people who aren't. Like this man, with two wheels and one flag, he staged a rally of his own, furious at the federal government for helping to subsidize the event. It's horrible. It's disgusting. This undecided voter says the message was moving, but it hasn't helped him make up his mind. It pleases me to know it, because I have many friends, you know, outside. Quebec, who are Canadian, and and if whether I would vote, if I ever vote yes, it would never be for resentment. The mass rally then broke into mini marches as pockets of patriotic Canadians tried to convince the unconvinced. If these people didn't come here, she says, you would have accused Canadians of not caring. But on this day, nobody said Canadians didn't care. The question was, did they make a difference? Mark Kelly, CBC News, Montreal. Well, it's not clear yet whether Quebecers will be moved or miffed by today's rally. But Bloc Québécois leader Lucien Bouchard is describing the whole thing as an insult to voters. Here's Tom Kennedy on the Yes campaign. The sovereignist's response. Not nearly as big, but nearly as noisy a rally of their own in Laval, just north of Montreal. Earlier in the day, after meeting supporters, Lucien Bouchard asked, where was the outpouring of love a few years ago when Quebec was asking for distinct society recognition? They say they love us now, he said, out of fear. It was obviously something desperate. Would this manifestation had taken place in Montreal today, if the polls would be now, uh, I would say 55% for the no and 45 for, for, for the yes. There wouldn't be any manifestation now, and Quebecers know it very well. 
pour essayer de jouer sur And Bouchard insécurité. said the total cost of the rally was over 4 million dollars and it is in direct violation of Quebec's strict electoral expenses law. He was asked if he might not use that to protest the referendum result if he loses. I'm not prepared to answer this question but I can say firsthand that it would appear to me preposterous to try to fight a democratic vote through a legal fight. But on the key question, would a mammoth display of affection make Quebecers feel differently about Canada? Not sure, Bouchard said, but it could even backfire. It might be that they will be negatively impressed by the fact that some people are trying a few days before uh, the, po the vote to try to influence them. And a few hours later, at his own rally, a plea to voters, don't be fooled. There was nothing spontaneous about the unity rally, he said. It was a political operation. Canadians tell us they love us, but they've always refused to accept our demands to change their federation. They say they love us, but they still want to back Jean Chrétien and his vision of Canada. On and on it went, a real sign that the sovereignist campaign believes the unity rally could do some damage. And in order to win the referendum, the Yes campaign must convince all those wavering voters that Canada is still the same. And in spite of all the goodwill of Canadians, the door to changing the Federation to satisfy Quebec has been permanently shut. Tom Kennedy, CBC News. The final result of the referendum was an incredibly narrow no victory. 50.58%. Just uh, slightly a majority of Quebecers voted no to becoming an independent country. And here you see um, uh, newspaper headlines from across the country announcing the results of the referendum. The aftermath and the aftershocks of the referendum would be felt for many years to come. The night of the referendum, uh, in a concession speech, Jacques Parizeau uh, blamed money and what he said was the ethnic vote for the reason why the referendum had failed, um, which many, many, many people, many Quebecers um, who uh, were not of, you know, who were not white people, were incredibly offended and rightfully so that Jacques Perizot had suggested somehow that as ethnic voters, they were somehow less Quebecers than other Quebecers. Um, and this really did tarnish Perizot's reputation. Uh, he retired from politics not long after this. And the sovereignty movement um, has been on a downward um, uh, trajectory ever since the defeat in 1995. Although there is still a core part of the population of Quebec uh, that would like sovereignty, they're a small minority at the moment. And uh, it doesn't look in the in the you know soon to be future that we would have another referendum again but you never know so i'd like to talk now a little bit more detail about the aftermath of the 1995 referendum the 1995 referendum had revealed both a divided quebec but also a divide between quebec and the rest of the country something that would not heal for many years to come and in many ways we are still feeling the aftershocks of that referendum and its so close result. The immediate after effects saw Jacques Perizot resign as the premier of the province and leader of the Parti Québécois, and Lucien Bouchard, who had been the leader of the federal level party, the Bloc Québécois, um, resign that position and become the premier of the, uh, of the province of Quebec and the leader of the Parti Québécois. Although there had been some talk um, that there would be another referendum in the years to come. It never materialized for a variety of reasons, which I'll go over um, shortly. At the federal level, the government of Canada did make some symbolic attempt to try to uh, heal the wounds that the referendum had opened up. A House of Commons motion, which passed, um, recognized Quebec as a distinct society within Canada. But the federal government also wanted to make clear that if there was ever to be another referendum again, that there would be clear guidelines on what actually constituted a referendum, what constituted a, a proper question, and uh, whether Quebec really even had the right to, um, to succeed at all. So these questions were put to the Supreme Court of the country. In 1998, they ruled that Quebec does not have the right to unilaterally succeed from Canada. 
However, if a clear majority of the people of the province uh, wished uh, for separation, then the rest of Canada uh, was required by law to enter into negotiations. Now, if that is a little bit unclear, you're not alone. Uh, basically, the Supreme Court seemed to sit on the fence on that one. The government of Canada, uh, under the Liberal Party, under uh, Jean Chrétien as Prime Minister, moved to uh, create more clarity around the issue of a future referendum. The Clarity Act, passed in 2000, um, was uh, largely spearheaded by this man, Stéphane Dion, who was a minister in Chrétien's government and who later went on to become the leader of the Liberal Party in the 2000s. Uh, Stéphane Dion and the Clarity Act basically proposed that only the House of Commons could decide, meaning the House of Commons in Ottawa, could decide whether a question was clear or not. That was the first thing the Clarity Act spelled out and that they would have veto power over any question that was not de determined to be clear. Um, and they also set out that any question that did not um, uh, clearly state that this was about sovereignty uh, would uh, be declared as unclear. So essentially saying that the, the wording that was used in the 1995 referendum about partnerships and that sort of thing uh, couldn't be used in a future referendum question. Of course, the Quebec um, uh, legislature very much disagreed with uh, the Clarity Act, and the Clarity Act has never been actually tested in court. One other further aspect of the Clarity Act was that it took um, one of the elements of the Supreme Court decision from 1998 that uh, in the event of a clear majority of the province wanting to separate that the Canada was required to negotiate, well, the Clarity Act spelled out that the House of Commons uh, in Ottawa would be the body that would determine whether a clear majority uh, or not had um, had determined that. And so this really um, means that they could interpret it as what one might call a supermajority, meaning two thirds of the province might have to agree to separate rather than just simply 50 uh, percent plus one, which was the position that the Parti Québécois uh, took in both of the referendums that have actually happened. The Parti Québécois and the Bloc Québécois continue to receive wide support uh, in the province, but sovereignty really over the past 20 years has been placed on the back burner for now. Quebec voters overall have seemed to be more concerned with economic and social issues than sovereignty. It's not to say that the issue won't come back again, but it's been quiet for the past 20 years. As we close out the 1990s and move into the 2000s and get closer and closer to the present day, there is one event that bears mentioning just because of the incredible impact it had on Canada and really the rest of the world, and that was the 9-11 terrorist attacks of September 11th, 2001. While the terrorist attacks were directed towards the United States, out of the 2,973 people who died in those attacks, 24 of them were Canadians. In the decades that followed, Canada, due to its uh, close friendship with the United States and traditional allyship, and also its proximity geographically, was heavily involved in realigning our defense and also um, adapting to the new war on terror. Canada took part in the Afghanistan conflict, which followed the fall of the Taliban. Uh, and in that conflict, um, uh, 158 Canadian soldiers uh, were killed. While Canada didn't take part in Iraq, it certainly was involved in the uh, battles against ISIS. And Canada has been uh, fundamentally changed in terms of our foreign policy as a result of the events of 2001. By the time we reached 2003, the Liberal Party had been in power for a decade. That's a decade where Jean Chrétien was the prime minister. And whenever a party has been in power that long, you begin to start to see, um, first of all, a, a general discontent with whatever the party is in power amongst the Canadian population. People are hungry for change, but also within the party itself, we often start to see um, uh, a breaking of ranks where people who were, you know, hoping to be able to move into positions of leadership are frustrated by the fact that the old leaders are still in place. So that was certainly happening with the Liberal Party in 2003. Jean Chrétien had been the Prime Minister the whole time, and his ambitious Finance Minister, Paul Martin, 
had been really eyeing his own leadership ambitions as well, but Gretchen was still in the way. We begin to see quite a bit of infighting within the Liberal Party at this time. Uh, there's a sizable proportion of the uh, caucus that ends up uh, lining up behind Paul Martin, trying to push Jean Chrétien to retire. Eventually, all this infighting uh, did force Chrétien to resign, and Paul Martin became uh, prime minister in 2003. However, uh, something came to light shortly after Paul Martin became prime minister, which would have a devastating effect on the Liberal Party and their electoral chances. And that was uh, the sponsorship scandal. Now, the sponsorship program was a program that the Liberal uh, government had implemented in Quebec after the uh, referendum. Obstensibly, it was um, a positive idea that they were going to try to promote Canada within the province of Quebec by sponsoring everything from like teams to um, just having more flags in the province to having more commercials uh, promoting the benefits of being a part of Canada. The idea was is that we'd uh, run a campaign in the province to try to increase pro-Canadian sentiment so that we're less likely to find ourselves in a referendum. However, it begins to become clear around 2004 that there was major corruption within the program. And this is where it all starts to fall apart. So uh, it, uh, subsequent investigations showed that much of the money was being funneled to liberal insiders in the province um, and it was being given for little to no work. And all of this starts hitting the news in 2004, and the Liberal Party um, is wearing all of the blame for it. However, it's not clear exactly how high up the corruption and the scandal actually went, and so a big inquiry is held, and Paul Martin is forced to uh, uh, you know, respond to the inquiry and give testimony at it. All of this is great television, but terribly embarrassing for the Liberal Party. And... Uh, even Jean Chrétien, in fact, uh, comes out of retirement to have to answer questions at the inquiry as well. Now, most of this, of course, had happened. The sponsorship program had been, happened under uh, Chrétien's tenure as prime minister, but it was Paul Martin that ended up uh, having to really do much of the explaining. Um, and although the investigation never provided any proof that uh, the corruption went all the way up to the very, very top of government, i.e. the prime minister, uh, nevertheless, during the election campaign in 2004, uh, the, the entire campaign was basically about the sponsorship scandal. So here you see the televised uh, leaders debate, um, Paul Martin, um, you know, struggling under the weight of questions coming from the opposition leader. In this case, a young Stephen Harper, who was the leader of um, the uh, Canadian Alliance, which was what the Reform Party had renamed itself to be in 2004. Uh, this reduced the uh, Liberals to a minority government. They managed to squeak out a minority in 2004, but in 2006, they lost the election altogether, and it just was completely downhill from there. In 2011, they were reduced to being the third largest party in government, which the Liberal Party had never been before since the inception of Canada. So the, the mid 2000s are really a period of massive decline for the Liberal Party as a whole. But what was a decline for the Liberals was of course an opportunity for those on the right side of the political spectrum and of course for this person that we see in the photo here, Stephen Harper, who will become Canada's next Prime Minister. So I want to give you a sense of just how much the seat count changed in the House of Commons following the demise of the Liberal Party in the early 2000s. So what you see here is the makeup of the House of Commons following the 2000 federal election. So this was the third majority government win for the Liberals under Jean Chrétien. But as I indicated, in the early 2000s, uh, there was a lot of infighting within the Liberal Party. There were people who were upset that after a decade in power, Jean Chrétien was still uh, in control, and eventually he was was forced to resign and he was replaced by Paul Martin, his former finance minister who became prime minister. 
the progressive conservatives had done better in the 2000 election than they had previously. If you recall, they were reduced to just two seats following the disastrous wash for them in the 1993 election. They were being led uh, at the 2000 election by Joe Clark, who was, if you recall, the former prime minister in the 1970s, uh, progressive conservative prime minister. So in the uh, years before uh, the 2004 election, he was replaced by uh, the younger Peter McKay. Uh, the Bloc Québécois um, uh, never really achieved the same heights that they had I after the 1993 election, but they still were commanding 38 seats in the House of Commons in 2000. They were now being led by Gilles Duceppe. If you recall, Lucien Bussard, who had been the leader of the Bloc Québécois, left his leadership position and decided to uh, take over the leadership of the Parti Québécois following the uh, 1995 referendum and he became premier of the province. So Gilles Duceppe was the leader of the Bloc Québécois now. So the Reform Party, uh, as you can see, the Reform Party uh, was doing really well at the 2000 election. It had achieved uh, official status as the official opposition. They had 66 seats. That means they had the second largest number of seats in government. The Reform Party, of course, as you know, was a splintering conservative party that had splintered off of the progressive conservatives in the late 1980s. And the problem that the Reform Party faced is that the bulk of their support came from Western Canada, came from the Prairie Provinces, particularly Alberta. Once you got into all, uh, Ontario and even further east than that, it was pretty much a wash. There was maybe one or two seats in Ontario, and that's about it. So in an effort to rebrand the party, to make it more palatable to people in Eastern Canada, the Reform Party became the Canadian Alliance. And they also had a new charismatic leader named Stephen Harper. Uh, and then I also just want to draw your attention to the new Democratic Party, uh, which was not doing very well at the 2000 election. Uh, they had only 13 seats. Alexa McDonough was their leader, but she was replaced by someone who I want to introduce you to only because the NDP would later in the 2000s achieve some of the greatest electoral success that they ever had under Jack Layton, a member of parliament from Toronto former Toronto City Councillor. Jack Layton proved to be one of the uh, most successful politicians the NDP have ever had um, in the 2000s. So this was the makeup basically just before the 2004 election. But then there was a moment that would change everything. I want to show you now. So this was the nightmare scenario that the Liberals faced. The right side of the political spectrum had united. The Canadian Alliance had made overtures to the Progressive Conservatives and they joined forces and became just the Conservative Party, the new Conservative Party. And their new leader would be Stephen Harper. Now with a united right-wing party, uh, people who were voting on the right side of the political spectrum had only one choice, and this was just on the eve of the 2004 election, just on the eve of when the sponsorship scandal came to light. So this was a perfect storm uh, that uh, the Liberals found themselves in. In the 2004 election, the Liberals under Paul Martin managed to hang on to a minority government. The Conservatives increased their vote share to 99 seats, the Bloc 54 seats and the NDP 19 seats. Um, largely the reason why uh, the Liberals had still managed to squeak out a minority government is the sponsorship scandal hadn't entirely run its course at that point in time. It was still ongoing and so there wasn't entirely a resolution and voters seemed to be wary of switching horses to the uh, somewhat untried young Stephen Harper at that time. So the Liberals maintained a minority government, yet this was the beginning of a slide that would get worse and worse for the Liberals during the 2000s. So let's take a look at the next election. So in the next election, the Conservative Party achieved minority government status. So they now were the party in control and Stephen Harper officially became the Prime Minister uh, with 124 seats. The Liberals, for the first time uh, since um, the time of Kim Campbell and Brian Mulroney, had been reduced to uh, being the official opposition with only 103 seats. Given um, both the disaster of the sponsorship scandal and this election, Paul Martin, not surprisingly, resigned. And a new leader of the Liberal Party, 
was chosen as Stéphane Dion. And now Stéphane Dion was um, the minister who, under Jean Chrétien, had proposed the Clarity Act, so he wasn't really well loved in Quebec, despite the fact that he was, of course, a Quebecer. Uh, Stéphane Dion and the liberal leader who would follow him after the next election, neither of them really were able to effectively mobilize liberal voters, and we saw the liberal vote share continue to decline. Here is uh, the way it looked after the next election. So the 2008 election, the Liberals did not fare much better. They're now reduced to just 77 seats. Stéphane Dion, um, given the, that his failure to actually turn the boat around for the Liberals, uh, decided to fall on his own sword, and he uh, stepped down as the leader of the Liberal Party. Following that, they had a leadership contest within the Liberal Party, and a new leader was chosen, and that person was Michael Ignatieff. Michael Ignatieff was um, actually a, an academic. He was a university professor who had spent most of his career working outside of the country. He didn't have much of a history of being a politician within Canada, so he was really an outsider. But the Liberal caucus was relatively divided um, on who would be uh, the next leader, and Michael Ignatieff, being an outsider, managed to clinch the leadership and become the leader. However, this would uh, not turn the tide for the Liberals, and under Ignatieff, the Liberals would fall to the very first time in their history, third party status. So let's move forward to the 2011 election, when Stephen Harper was uh, trying to finally get his coveted majority. He had won two minority governments. He'd been in power as Prime Minister for some time, and here's how the 2011 election panned out. So this was the status of the 2011 election. The Liberal Party had its worst showing, arguably, in any election since Confederation. And for the first time since Confederation, the Liberal Party was neither the governing party nor the official opposition. They had, in fact, fallen to third party status with just 34 seats. On the other hand, the election was a resounding success for the Conservative Party, uh, the new Conservative Party under Stephen Harper. After uh, three elections, Stephen Harper had finally achieved his uh, coveted majority. It was also a remarkable election for the new Democratic Party, the NDP. The NDP arguably had their best election ever under uh, Jack Layton. Jack Layton, of course, the charismatic um, a uh, former city councillor from Toronto, managed to uh, pull off what had never been done before with the NDP. They swept through the province of Quebec, uh, which was dubbed an orange wave in the press, winning seats that they had never, ever won before, uh, securing 103 seats in the government. This, of course, came at the expense of the Bloc Québécois that fell to just four seats. There was talk in the press that this signaled that um, uh, the sovereignty movement was on an ebb in the province of Quebec and the, that Quebecers were more interested in sending NDP representatives to Ottawa than Bloc representatives. So not surprisingly, with such a really bad showing, uh, Michael Ignatieff, who had only ever, um, you know, been briefly a politician, decided to go back into his academic life. And then the Liberal Party had to find, yet again, another new leader. In this instance, they found a new leader in the son of the former Prime Minister, Pierre Elliott Trudeau. His son, Justin Trudeau, had become a member of Parliament um, uh, earlier, a few years earlier, and he had been representing a riding in Montreal. He secured the leadership of the Liberal Party and eventually under Justin Trudeau, the Liberal Party would surge back into governing status. Stephen Harper had successfully united the right and was Prime Minister for nine years. Now, Stephen Harper as an individual was uh, certainly conservative ideologically. I mean, he was uh, in his time uh, working in policy for the Reform Party. On most major issues, he was uh, very far to the right on uh, conservative politics. However, he also proved himself to be a very pragmatic politician and a politician who understood most importantly, how to win elections. Uh, within his own caucus, he largely silenced um, voices on what he knew were divisive social issues such as same-sex marriage and abortion because he believed that they would hamper the Conservatives' electoral chances. 
Uh, in terms of his actual tenure as prime minister, uh, his government took strong, strong stances against terrorism, made tougher sentences under the criminal code. Um, they focused primarily on tax cuts rather than social programs, so there was certainly no expansion of social programs to, under his watch. He was criticized for many things, but certainly one of the biggest was uh, withdrawing Canada from the Kyoto Accord, which was an accord, an international accord meant to limit uh, greenhouse gases and global warming. Uh, and generally, he didn't do much during his time to do anything to fight global warming. By the time that the 2015 election rolled around, the Conservatives now were the party that had been in power for just about a decade. And in Canadian politics, a decade is usually just about enough. People usually want a uh, change, and that's a hard, um, a hard sentiment to fight against, and certainly Stephen Harper uh, had difficulty as well. The 2015 election saw a remarkable success for the Liberals, though. They surged under their new leader, Justin Trudeau, from third place, both in the polls at the beginning of the election campaign um, and in seats all the way to a majority government and after that uh, Stephen Par Harper uh, followed what most politicians do and retired from politics so here you have an overview of the last several elections in uh, Canada so 2004 was the last time that the Liberals uh, held government prior to Justin Trudeau and that was uh, the uh, uh, leadership of Paul Martin who in 2004, despite the sponsorship scandal, managed to eke out a minority government. But two years later, uh, he lost to the Conservatives, and that began uh, Stephen Harper's time as Prime Minister. Stephen Harper followed with two minority governments and eventually achieving majority status in 2011. Then, as I said, in 2015, uh, after having been in power for just about a decade, they lost power to the Liberals who surged from third place back to majority status under Justin Trudeau. The Liberals uh, were reduced to a minority in 2019, and in the most recent election, they also won but still kept it to a minority. So we are currently in a minority government situation with Justin Trudeau as the current Prime Minister of Canada. So that brings us up to the present day. So now that we've arrived at the present day, this is a history course, of course, but it's uh, important to also look a little bit into the future. And so I'm just going to go over some of the major challenges that the country will likely continue to face in the years to come as successive governments uh, try to tackle them. Probably one of the biggest things that will continue to um, uh, be a, an important matter for any future government of Canada will be the ongoing reconciliation efforts with the Indigenous peoples of the country. This has been a very slow, long coming process, um, really since the 1990s. If you think about the fact that the last residential school had uh, only closed in the 1990s, um, we get to uh, the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples in 1996, which laid out a whole series of recommendations that the government should um, follow in order to achieve some form of reconciliation. And most of those recommendations were never acted upon. And this is under successive governments, whether liberal or conservative. In 2008, there was a uh, some sort of resolution to the residential school um, uh, system in, the, in terms of the compensation that was owed to former members of the residential school system and the Canadian government officially apologized in 2008. However, there is still ongoing uh, litigation with respect to that and the Canadian government has still been fighting uh, many former Indigenous um, uh, children uh, who had attended residential schools in court. So uh, reconciliation on this matter seems, um, you know, still a long way off. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission report, which came out in 2015, again laid out a number of recommendations, most of which still have not been acted upon either. And most recently, the discovery of hundreds of Indigenous children's bodies um, who uh, had died while attending residential schools has really reopened this wound across the country and uh, we are uh, not that much closer to achieving true reconciliation uh, across the country. There is, uh, there have been some symbolic movements towards reconciliation, such as the adoption of a National Day for Truth and Reconciliation on September 30th, um, but these largely symbolic um, uh, motions haven't really affected the real change that would require 
uh, improving conditions on uh, reservations and also settling the many, many, many numerous outstanding uh, legal and land claims that um, uh, the government has been dragging its feet on across the country. Racism, privilege, structural inequity still continue to be major issues across the country. Um, marginalized groups, people of color, natives, immigrants, particularly Muslims also recently um, face discrimination on a daily basis. Um, this is uh, partially because of um, uh, structural racism that's been built into the way that police um, relate to marginalized groups. Examples are the practice of carding, which until recently was the norm in Toronto, where uh, police could essentially ask anyone uh, who was out and about in the city to show ID, and they didn't have to provide a reason to do so. And uh, we since learned that disproportionately, police officers asked people of color for their identification far more than they asked white people. Uh, and so this is just one example. All, we're also affected by the same sort of things that are happening in the US. Um, numerous high profile police shootings of um, uh, people of color and um, the uh, fallout from those shootings has affected um, us up north as well. And these will be issues that any government of the future will have to continue to um, uh, work with and find solutions for. Islamophobia in particular has been an issue that um, uh, Canadians have dealt with for the past um, really two decades. Uh, Islamophobia became something um, really brought to the forefront after the uh, 2001 terrorist attack on the World Trade Center in the United States. What that did is it created an anti-Islamic backlash, uh, which really unfortunately it still exists today where all Islamic people were painted with a broad uh, brush. Uh, examples of, of this backlash against um, uh, Islamic people can be found all over the base, particularly in Quebec. For, for example, uh, the Quebec Bill 21, which basically prohibited all religious symbols for those who worked in the public service, um, such as t teachers, that sort of thing. So essentially, um, it um, uh, it singles out uh, by nature of, of what it's prohibiting anyone who is Islamic, say an Islamic woman from wearing a hijab, because it prohibits all religious symbols. Um, notably, it does not, for example, take away the crucifix, which exists um, openly displayed in the Quebec legislature. Um, so it's really a one-sided approach that Quebec has. Um, on one side, they are saying that it's all about secularism, but at the same time, uh, Christian symbols within the province remain front and center, whereas uh, symbols of other religion are suppressed. Uh, we see just how deep some of the racism and hatred towards Islamic people have uh, has gone with examples such as the 2017 uh, shooting spree where a, a self-radicalized white man um, essentially opened fire in a mosque killing several uh, Islamic men, uh, defenseless uh, men, and uh, this was a tragedy which shook the nation and um, made headlines around the world. And even more recently, just this past summer in 2021, the murder of uh, a Muslim family in London, Ontario, who were um, uh, basically uh, driven over with a car um, by a, a person who had um, a deep-seated racism and hatred towards Islamic people. So these are issues that have not been solved. They're issues that continue to affect Canadians across the country and that future governments will have to reckon with. The disparity between uh, women and men continues to be something that um, future governments will have to to deal with. Although there has been obviously a quite a bit of movement on um, achieving some form of equality between men and women, uh, the income of women, for example, of just one issue, is still only 89% of men. Um, and women still face widespread misogyny and glass ceilings, sometimes invisible ceilings. And for women of color, it can be obviously even worse. We still have only had 
one female prime minister in our history, which uh, obviously is something that should be rectified at some point in the future. Um, examples of, of some of the, the worst forms of misogyny that the country has faced uh, were the Montreal massacre, which happened at a, a polytechnic school in Montreal, where a, a man uh, essentially opened fire, singling out all the women who were in an engineering uh, program, murdering them. Um, there's also the ongoing effort to try to find justice for the hundreds of missing and murdered uh, Indigenous women uh, who um, uh, have been overlooked by police forces across the country. There has recently been a commission to try to look more deeply into the subject. And in 2018, there was a, um, uh, a van attack by a man who had self-identified as an incel, which is um, uh, basically a um, sub-internet movement of radicalized um, uh, women-hating men, better his best way to put it, who um, uh, attacked uh, women on the street in Toronto by running them over with a van, killing many of them in 2018. Um, you know, and all of this it also is coupled by the fact that the justice system in many cases marginalizes um, women's voices, particularly on uh, issues such as sexual assault in our justice system. And these are issues that will continue to be something that governments are going to have to deal with in the future. There's also ongoing struggles in order to achieve equality for LGBTQ people, that is lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgendered people within the country. Uh, in 1968, homosexuality was finally decriminalized, um, and there have been major strides um, over the years since then. Mulroney's government, for example, in 1992, finally ended the ban on homosexuals serving in the armed forces. And in 2005, Canada became one of the first countries in the world to legalize same-sex marriage. Uh, there are gay pride events which are held annually in most cities across the country and uh, to this date there are still quite a way to go in terms of achieving any equality for trans uh, gendered people uh, and so this remains still an issue that uh, governments will deal with as well the issue of global warming is something that's not just confronting canada but the entire world but as one of the wealthiest countries in the world canada has an important role to play in helping solve the um, uh, issue of global warming. And we don't have a very good track record on this issue. First of all, there was the failure of the 1997 Kyoto Protocol. Uh, we pulled out of that under Stephen Harper, but it's really not um, a something you can simply pin on the Conservatives. Both Liberal governments and Conservative governments have failed over and over again to meet any uh, self-created targets to limit uh, the emission of greenhouse gases. There have been some uh, political parties which have risen up to try to make this a central issue. One example, of course, is the Green Party in Canada. And um, for a time, they had uh, their leader was Elizabeth May, who was a fairly successful politician, and she did a lot to bring these issues to the forefront. Um, but the environment continues to drive political debate as we see more and more extreme weather in the form of forest fires, flooding, uh, hurricanes, that sort of thing. It's impossible to ignore the um, growing repercussions of uncontrolled global warming across the world. And in many ways, the global warming issue also um, spells uncertainty for the Canadian economy. The Canadian economy has for decades been really a resource-based economy. We have uh, in many ways an over-dependence on resources. It's through resources, particularly our oil resources, which have made Canada such a wealthy country today. Of course, the problem of oil prices going up and down um, we have uh, times where incredibly low oil prices, times where they're high, but um, in, in terms of the future of oil prices is probably not looking very favorable. Uh, we have an increasingly global economy and competition in all sectors, and Canada uh, has yet to es essentially establish itself as a post-oil country. Uh, yet there have been moments where Canada has been able to uh, uh, do well uh, forming partnerships abroad. NAFTA is one really good example. Trans-Pacific Partnership is another good example. These trade agreements um, uh, certainly offer uh, the opportunity for Canada to be able to step out um, and be competitive on the global stage. Most recently, we have the rise of nationalist populism around the world. Canada has had a little bit of this in our own politics, um, but we are increasingly in a world where 
um, economic inequality, and a decline in social mobility has fueled populism and nationalism as political forces. And what that's meant is, is that we see this growth of unilateralism and transactional dis diplomacy. It, it means that traditional alliances um, uh, are weakened. And in a sense, uh, countries are all um, essentially uh, fighting independently for their own interests. And this really um, is not a good sign for the world as a whole. Uh, most of the big issues such as global warming require international cooperation. Things like the pandemic of the past two years, again, require international cooperation. And yet, as the pandemic revealed, when push comes to shove, countries will look after their own first and foremost. And this obviously provides a challenge for Canada. It provides a challenge for any country, but especially a country like Canada, which is not um, particularly powerful from a military standpoint and relies on its uh, network of relationships around the world in order to do well. So certainly future governments are going to have to uh, continue to deal with this as it comes. And that brings us to the end of Canadian history. Thank you so much for coming along with me on this journey. We've gone through thousands of years of history on this land, and I hope that you've maybe learned a little bit along the way and maybe appreciated just how much rich history is underneath your feet when you are walking down the street. I hope to see you again in a history class in the future. And now that the term is winding down, I hope you get uh, some time to relax with your friends and your family. It's been my privilege to have been your professor this term, and I look forward to seeing you again in a history class sometime soon.